All right, so we have Wild Beyond the Witch Light. What inspired you to do this? Why did, I can tell that you've had a lot of fun making this book. It was a fun book, uh, and the reason I wanted to do it because I've been in love with the Feywild for a long time, and we haven't really gone to the Feywild yet in 5th edition, and it was always my hope that we could. And I've sort of ha had a story in mind for a number of years, but the Feywild story just kept getting kicked down the curb by other things that were more timely. So at last, here we are. See, I saw you post about uh, you know Curse of Strahd, and this used to be your favorite adventure. Used to be, or maybe it still is. Yeah. <laughs> but you are very excited about Witchlight. Yes. Yeah. Yes. What, what 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 about this has like drawn your eye? <laughs> um, in some ways, Curse of Strahd and the Wild Beyond the Witchlight are kind of like two sides of a coin. Uh, they're they're similar in a lot of respects. One being that they sort of go to kind of a parallel plane. Um, in the case of Curse of Strahd, of course, you're going to the Shadowfell, and now in the Wild Beyond the Witchlight, you're going to the Feywild. They're both mirrors of the material plane of, of the normal world. And structurally, they're similar as well. Um, in Curse of Strahd, you sort of get pulled into this domain, and then there's the scary castle on the promontory, that you know inevitably you're going to end up in, and there's a scary creature that lives up there. Um, the wild beyond the witch light, you're kind of drawn into this fey realm. Uh, it has its own rules um, that you kind of have to follow to survive there. But in the middle of the domain, there is a castle on a promontory uh, glaring down at you, and there's a mystery up there uh, that, that beckons you, and what you find up there is hopefully not what you were expecting. Um, and so uh, you can either go there directly or as directly as you're able to, or you can kind of meander around the domain a little bit, get to meet some of the locals, learn about what's going on, and then go up to the castle on the hill. Um, so uh, beyond those similarities, of course, they're very different adventures in terms of how they feel about the emotions and mood that they're trying to evoke. And of course, the creatures that you're meeting are altogether different. Um, not the shadowy undead denizens and werewolves of the of the shadowed realm, but the fairies and goblins and hags and miscreants of the uh, shall we say uh, fairy realm, the glittering realm of wonder and whimsy. You no, know, I've always think that Shadowfell and Ravenloft is kind of about repetition. Yeah, I expect that the Feywild is perhaps not so much. No, it's a bit more unpredictable. Instead of dealing with a Dark Lord, you're dealing with an Archfey, and Archfey are by their nature mercurial. And uh, so this is a more chaotic place than, than you're probably accustomed to in, in the Shadowfell. I don't want to give too much away, but uh, <laughs> there are some mechanisms in the wild by, beyond the Witchlight that help you as a DM paint the Feywild in a certain dazzling rainbow color uh, and uh, invest in the characters of that realm certain qualities. For instance, what I mean by that is uh, there are some rules that are sort of stipulated up front, like for instance the rule of hospitality and how you as a DM can use that and in some cases weaponize it against your players. <laughs> How do you weaponize hospitality? <laughs> hospitality? <laughs> um, well, you know, if, if the characters really want to carry on in the Feywild and, and get to where they need to go, um, it can be a lot easier if they follow the quote-unquote rules of the Feywild, um, be it the rule of ownership or the rule of hospitality or any of the other rules. Uh, if they don't, um, they could find themselves confounded or slowed down. And the rule of hospitality basically states that a host has to be good to you uh, while you're in their house, but they want something in return, um, a, certain, a level of civility, if nothing else. And if the characters aren't prepared to be civil, bad things can happen to them if they break the rule. Um, uh, if they take something that does not belong to them, even if they don't know that it doesn't like who it belongs to, that can that can come back at them uh, through the rule of ownership, and the proper owner can demand something from you, or you 
could find yourself in a bit of a pickle. Um, and fairies are generally tricky. Right. There are some there are some tricksy characters that you will run into, but then there are some that are aren't who are generally just kind-hearted souls who want to help you and um, they sort of recognize you're an outsider and may not understand the rules fully and so they may not hold you to them quite so stringently as they might others who should know better. Do you have any favorite characters that are in this? Because uh, it's... There are so many quirky characters in this particular adventure, so many. Um, the ones that you encounter in the carnival, of course, which we haven't talked about yet, but um, but then the ones in the Feywild themselves, there are there are probably more individual sort of concepted characters in this story than we've ever done before in a published fifth edition adventure. But my one of my favorites is Sir Talavar. He is a fairy dragon knight. Um, Fantastic. Yes, who is very much on the up and up. Um, <laughs> he's a he's a noble soul and has trained many other Feywild knights in his illustrious career, and he has found himself in a bit of, of a predicament. And if the characters help him out of it, he's sort of like their stall. He can be a stalwart. Uh, and he actually, um, when they need it most, actually drops off a little gift for them uh, that, that can help them on their way. But I think what, what sold me on Sir Talavar wasn't simply the concept of a, of a valiant, um, chivalrous fa fairy dragon, but also the art that Sean Wood did, which um, uh, gave him like a little sword and accoutrement and just the way he sort of carries himself. He sort of won, won my heart. Another figure in the Feywild who I love is Jingle Jangle, <laughs> who is a, uh, she's a female goblin who collects keys. And keys are um, near and dear to her heart and part of her soul. And at one point she actually gives you one that can be helpful, sort of parting with it. And she's one of the ones I mentioned earlier who recognizes the characters are outsiders and may not want to give her something in return, even though that's sort of the law of the land. Um, I just love I just love some of the helpful characters that you can run into. It, it's also hard not to love all the NPCs that I've seen in the book, and they're all very very charming, even when they're terrible. Which is, I guess, kind of the appeal, right? When you look yes. at David Bowie and Labyrinth and, and any kind of Fae story. Uh, there is there is a charm. There is a charm, and um, it's funny you should mention David Bowie because um, I've always loved his character in in the labyrinth, and I love how it shows that the the side of the Fey. Well, there are two sides of the Fey. There's um, and one of them is this sort of darker side, and I think that's one of the other things that appealed to me about the story was that I'm a big fan of Ravenloft and I love the dark, edgy stuff. I could bring a little bit of that into the wild beyond the witchlight and have this sort of undercurrent of dread um, that characters may be oblivious to most of the time, but it's there. Yeah, like I don't feel safe with David Bowie's character in the labyrinth until maybe the very end yeah. where you're like, maybe he was helping all along. Right. Right. But you don't know. And, but there's a lot of other stories where they, no, they were not helping at all. Yes. <laughs> they yes. were coming for your soul. Yeah. The, the Archfey of Prismere, who I I'm not, haven't talked much about, is very much that kind of complicated character whose motives are ambiguous. Um, could be helpful, could be hugely detrimental. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll see how it plays out in groups. And, and there's also domains, essentially, in the Feywild as well. So there's, uh, within the Feywild, we have created uh, what are called domains of delight as a concept. Uh, and they are the mere opposite of domains of dread. Whereas a domain of dread is a prison containing its dark lord. A domain of delight is uh, created by the Archfey who rules it. And the Archfey has complete control over the domain in terms of its structure, malleability, or whatever. Um, and the more powerful the Archfey, the bigger the domain can be. Uh, this is sort of um, kind of based on the notion that every creature in the Feywild has some control over that environment. If you cry by a rock because you're sad, a little, you know, blue flower might spring up out of the ground and just sort of, um, you know, 
weep tears of dew, um, like, it's, like the land itself is feeling your sorrow. If you're an archfey in the Feywild, your emotions are so powerful that you can shape mountains and forests and rivers and the whole lot of it and basically sculpt a domain out of nothing. And so there are these domains of delights scattered all throughout the Feywild, each with an archfey ruler. Um, all as individual as any Dark Lord or any other entity. They're all unique creatures. And so, and sometimes these domains can overlap and sometimes they don't. And, you know, it's, it gives you as a creative the opportunity to create Archfey domains, Archfey and their domains of delight uh, of your own, uh, modeled after the one that we present in the Wild Beyond the Witchlight, which is the domain of Prismere. Can you give me a little bit more insight into Prismere? Yeah. So because we knew we were creating this new concept of the Domains of Delight, Prismere sort of stands as an archetypal um, archphase domain. But in this story, when the characters first come across it, it's in a bit of a state. Um, uh, things have gone a little bit awry. And so uh, it has kind of split into three realms. So one domain, three realms. Each realm has its own sort of texture and complexion to it. And so what that means is, in the course of the adventure, you really get to explore three very different environments within the Feywild. And that's, that was the major appeal of doing that, was giving us a chance to show you that the Feywild isn't just, for instance, one big happy primeval forest. Right. You know, there are different kinds of environments that you can have within this setting. And Prismere sort of embodies that. Yeah, like, I, I, again, like, I know I'm referencing a lot of 80s films, but, like, Legend, for instance, scales pretty uh, super evil to, yeah, unicorns. Right. So. Yes. Where does the carnival come into this, and why did you include a clown on the cover? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, clowns freak me out. Like, okay. they freak many people out. And uh, uh, one of the direction one of the directions for the cover was, we want to balance the charm and the, the dread. Ah, uh, so clown. <laughs> yeah. It's Perfect. an easy, easy way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Happy, yeah. happy little carnival tents, lots of sort of bright orange colors, but then dark and stormy sky and a big clown sort of hanging above the scene with a maniacal grin on his face. What's going on here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that tends to ruin my day. Um, yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and so trying to strike that balance. Now the carnival, the Witchlight Carnival it, um, came about because one of my favorite novels is Something Wicked This Way Comes by Ray Bradbury, which of course has a carnival. And it is also impossible to make into a film, but they tried. It, they gave it a good old fashioned try, <laughs> yeah. and the best Disney tradition. Um, it is a hard film, it, it is a hard book to adapt. And so I wanted from the very start to try to um, uh, create a carnival that was a bit of a, an homage. Mm -hmm. And uh, it occurred to me fairly early on that a carnival is a great place to have a fey crossing because it means that you can have the carnival show up on any world. Yeah. Um, you know, your home game world, Greyhawk, Forgotten Realms, the Witchlight Carnival can land anywhere and the fey crossing goes with it. So um, it makes for an easy point of entry into the realm into the domain of Prismere. Um, the carnival itself, I also wanted to do because I thought it would be fun to have a carnival that was fey themed. And what would that mean? And how could the characters learn a little bit about the Feywild by experiencing the carnival before they actually go to the Feywild? Right. So they kind of have a few of the rules or concepts down before they get there. I thought that was a really neat opportunity. 